in the end, for the lonely Jayusi, love trumped prudence. One day in early April, he sent one of his deputies to watch the family's house. When the lookout spotted Jayusi's wife walking home from a visit with her parents, he drove his car next to her and introduced himself. The two spoke for a moment, then the woman disappeared into her house. When she emerged again, she had her bags and three children in tow. Jayusi's plans were coming into shape, and now he had his wife to help him while away the hours until everything was ready. The target date for delivering Zarqawi's mighty bomb was less than two weeks away. The trip wires began firing off almost at once, starting in the outlying towns and far suburbs of the capital and pulsing through invisible networks that led to the Muhabbarat's operations center. The agency's sensors, at first, picked up odd puzzle pieces, such as the disappearance one day of the entire family of a well-known Zarqawi associate, the Palestinian called Jayusi. The jihadist himself had not been seen in Jordan in years. Had he smuggled his family to Iraq to join him? A bigger clue landed on the desk of Abu Mutaz, the youthful counterterrorism officer who had tried to turn Zarqawi after he emerged from prison with the 1999 amnesty. Nearly five years later, Abu Mutaz was a captain with subordinates and responsibilities that extended to regional offices across the country. Now, one of those offices in Irbid, a city near the Syrian border, was picking up multiple reports about strangers with large amounts of cash and a highly specific shopping list, a small number of used but sturdy cars and trucks and warehouse rentals located away from houses and pedestrian traffic. Abu Mutaz pressed for details. The mysterious shoppers have behaved strangely enough to pique local interest and, since then, the suspicions had deepened. Routine queries about their identities ran into dead ends. In fact, it soon became clear that the buyers were not the real buyers. They're using middlemen, Abu Mutaz concluded. We don't know anything about who's behind this. The Muhabbarat's men picked up one of the intermediaries, a local car broker in his 40s, who had gotten into trouble for shady dealings in the past. Since his earlier scrapes with the law, He had gone straight and even become religious, though not a zealot. When the Muhabbarat came for him, he grew exceedingly nervous, quickly blurting everything he could remember about the man who had hired him to buy a Chevy Caprice. I didn't even take a commission, the broker protested. But the names the broker supplied turned out to be fakes and the phone numbers he had scribbled down no longer worked. Now the only firm leads the Muhabbarat had were descriptions. Details about the vehicles, including the Chevy and the large yellow truck of German make, and vague accounts of the mysterious men who had bought them. Everything about the transactions from registration papers to licenses plates, had been stolen or fabricated. Meanwhile, more disturbing reports were landing on Abu Mutaz's desk. Several hardware stores in the area had reported large cash purchases of certain chemicals closely tracked by the intelligence service because of their potential use in explosives. Alarmed, Abu Mutaz appealed to his supervisors. 
Soon agents throughout the country joined the now urgent search for the Capriche and the yellow truck. We had been patiently gathering information until we heard about these chemical supplies, he remembered afterward. The amounts suggested that this was no longer a search for a few terrorists trying to make a weapon. These appeared to be a much bigger project. So far, the Muhabbarat's leaders had seen no reason to bring American officials into the case. There had been no mention of specific targets and no suggestion of involvement by Al-Qaeda or Zarqawi in whatever was unfolding in Irbid. Practically speaking, there was little the CIA could offer. The skills essential for solving such a case were ones that the Jordanians already possessed in abundance. In the gritty art of human intelligence gathering, they were wired in a way that the Americans, for all their money and technical wizardry, were not, and Abu Mutaz was widely regarded as one of the best. Abu Mutaz hailed from tiny Tafilah, a 3,000-year-old East Bank town where ancestral roots matter more than schooling or wealth. He used his good grades and tribal connections as a ticket to an overseas education in Qatar, where he had studied journalism and envisioned a career in newspapers or television. Instead, he was offered an entry-level post in the Mukhabarat after scoring high on an entrance exam. His writing skills quickly earned him a spot drafting reports for the director on counter-terrorism cases. But Abu Mutaz was a natural as a field intelligence officer, showing real talent for recruiting informants among the jihadists. Though not especially religious himself, he had an open, authentic manner that made people trust him. For every person, there is a key that will get you inside. You just have to find it. He often said.